Hare Krishna, uh, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, on behalf of the Gita Reading Society and all the devotees in Singapore, uh, we want to welcome His Holiness Bhaktivikna Vinash Narsingha Maharaj uh, to join us today for the last session in a series that we have been hosting uh, where we request senior disciples uh, of Srila Prabhupada to spend time with us, give us their association, and to speak to us about Srila Prabhupada's legacy, his pastimes, and to guide us and, um, and, and let us know how we should, as, as the next generation of devotees, continue to be connected deeply with Srila Prabhupada. What are the activities we should do? Uh, what are the things that we should be looking out for? and how we can continue to take the legacy of Srila Prabhupada forward. Nasingha Maharaj is no stranger to us. Uh, he has been a dear well-wisher and a guide to many of us in Singapore. And he's been an inspiring leader and Srila Prabhupada's disciple. Uh, he has been preaching in Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, um, China, and he has given so much of inspiration, support, guidance, and shelter to many devotees around the world. Maharaj, thank you so much for taking your time uh, to spend with us today from Sridhar Mayapur. And uh, over to you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksur Milikanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyabadi Paschatyate Shatarine Vanchaka Upatarabhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Vacha Patitanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So, first of all, I just want to tell everyone that right now in Mayapur, there's a, something of a thunderstorm going on. It seems to happen every evening about this time. So I'm just praying to Krishna that somehow our connection will hold out for, a, for the next hour and we can have some association. But if anything goes wrong along the way, you know, don't be surprised because, you know, I'm in Mayapur and Mayapur is kind of, it's a remote region and the network is not very stable. Anyway, we'll keep our fingers crossed as we say and depend on Krishna's mercy. Let's see what happens. So Srila Prabhupada wanted Mayapur anyway. He established Mayapur as one of the main centers of the, the headquarters of our movement, actually here in Mayapur, the world headquarters. It's such a remote place, you know. <laughs> I, I joined the movement 1971 in London so at that time, it was difficult for Americans to get visas to come to India. And Prabhupada saw the devotees joining in London. And when he saw the young man joining in London, he said, you know, he said, these men, you can send some of these men to India. He said, we need young men in India to establish our movement in India. So I didn't come to India immediately. Oh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Uh, okay. Just... Okay. So we'll do it like that. I'll, I'll nullify. I'll close down my video camera, and it might be if we can keep speaking. That will be sufficient. That will do us. Okay. So I I came to uh, Prabhupada. Let us know. He thought it would be really good if we could come to India. He want he 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 wanted us to come and help establish the movement in India. He had plans for developing Krishna consciousness in India. I didn't come immediately. It took me a a little while before I understood Prabhupada wanted me to do some service in India, but I did get around to it. And I came like it was about 1970, uh, I think it was 1970, 74 I came to India or so like that or yeah about 74 and I stayed for four years in India we had the opportunity to be more with Prabhupada in India in the west it wasn't so easy to be with Prabhupada uh, There were more people, more devotees. There were not so many devotees in India at that time. But generally, being with Prabhupada, I would just try to hear. I didn't have a lot, I didn't have any real personal interaction with Srila Prabhupada. Are we okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes Maharaj, we can hear we can hear you. Uh, okay. Much. Okay, so I didn't have personal interaction with Prabhupada. I was just trying to hear Prabhupada and to serve Prabhupada. I took that opportunity. Srila Prabhupada was very spiritually powerful, although in size he's not very tall, but just his aura and his demeanor was it was so powerful it was so amazing and we were all completely subservient to him we all just fell at his feet you know whatever he said to do, to do we'd immediately try to do it the first time we saw Prabhupada, i went to the airport in london and we waited there in the middle of the night Somehow Prabhupada came off a flight in the middle of the night and we, we'd been waiting there for an hour or two. We, don't, we all just fell at his feet. Everybody just fell down in the airport offering obeisances. And Prabhupada saw us and he just smiled and greeted us and then he got in the car and went to the temple. And when he got to the temple, he, Prabhupada was staying in our temple. That was a, a small temple we had in London at that time. It was a uh, a place called Number Seven Bury Place. It's not very far away from the present place which they have in uh, in uh, in in the centre of London, just just off Oxford Street. There, it's just near to the British Museum, Number Seven Bury Place. So it it was a, a like six floor house. And uh, probably the temple was on the ground floor, and we had the prasadam downstairs in the basement, and Prabhupada had the floor which was just above the temple, and then the other floors were where the devotees stayed. And devotees were joining. We were going through like a boom period in those days. People were really joining. So Prabhupada came, it was about this time of the year, I remember Prabhupada came for Janmastami. And when we came back from the airport, then we, we were all allowed to go and sit in Prabhupada's room and talk to us and greet, you know, and distribute a little posada. And then he told us, okay, it's late, you should take rest, we'll see you tomorrow. And like that, you know, it was nothing very special but it was sweet and Prabhupada liked to be with the devotees the one devotee had come from America and he was saying you know this room and this place this is not good enough for Prabhupada 
you know, it was just one small room with an attached toilet, bathroom. And he was saying, this is not good enough for Prabhupada. So he wrote to Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, he said, he said, we will just use your room and we will get you a room in a hotel when you come. We'll get you a nice suite in the hotel. But Srila Prabhupada wrote back to the devotee and told him, he said, I don't want to stay in the hotel. I like to stay in the temple and I like that room. <laughs> so the, the devotee from America was really shocked, you know, he couldn't believe it. But we were we were rejoicing. We were so happy. We thought so nice. Prabhupada liked to be with the devotees. He liked to stay with the devotees. And he showed it. So every morning we'd go for a walk. Prabhupada would walk sometimes near the temple. Sometimes we have, sometimes if somebody had a car, then we'd take Prabhupada in the car, go to a park a bit further away. But Prabhupada always liked to walk. He walked because the doctor told him. Some doctor told him, he said, Swamiji, every morning you need to go for a walk. So when Prabhupada got that instruction from the doctor, he took it seriously. And where, no matter where he was, he liked to go for a walk. It was very interesting to see how Prabhupada uh, arranged his life, you know. Prabhupada, for example, I remember seeing Prabhupada in New York in the, in the Brooklyn temple. In the Brooklyn temple in New York, Prabhupada would go out in the garden and have his oil massage in New York, in Brooklyn. Could you imagine it? He was sitting out there in the garden and the devotee would give him his oil massage in the morning. It was a summer morning. It was okay. It wasn't cold. But Prabhupada liked that. He had his routine. He liked to go for a walk in the morning. He'd come back and he would always come back just in time to greet the deities. He Somehow he was so careful about the time. We never saw him asking what is the time or anything. He just knew to come back and he was always back just in time to greet the deities. And after the deity greeting, then we'd have the Guru Puja and then Prabhupada would give class. And Prabhupada would give class for about half an hour or more. And then he would go upstairs, take his breakfast and like then after breakfast then after some time, you know, later in the morning, he'd take his massage. And he, he liked to keep this kind of schedule. He'd have a massage twice a day. He said it kept him alive. He'd have a massage in the morning and massage again in the evening. Sometimes Tamal Krishna Maharaj would give him a massage, but Prabhupada said, he said, your massage, he said to Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he said, your massage is like a tickle. He liked a very, I liked a very strong, vigorous massage. So the people who would give him massages were usually pretty powerfully, strongly built people. Hari Sori, when he was a young man, he was pretty strong. He was pretty powerful. He could give a good massage to Prabhupada. Prabhupada liked his massage. Mm. So Prabhupada liked also to have these uh, big people around him as well. Most of the leaders were quite powerful uh, physically, <laughs> physically as well as verbally. And I think at that time in Prabhupada's movement, it was necessary to have managers like that. So the people who were around Prabhupada, most of them all, they were all pretty tall people, pretty powerfully built, heavy people. And Prabhupada utilized them to run the society and to get things done and move the people. <laughs> Although Prabhupada himself wasn't so big, but still he understood the nature of our movement. He understood there's some difficult people in our movement and he saw the need to have powerful people to manage and to lead. And he enjoyed that. He enjoyed having these kind of people around him, giving them a chance to do some service for Krishna. Prabhupada was expert at engaging people in 
service for Krishna. He understood everybody's ability and he could give them just the right kind of activity to motivate them. For some people, he would push them to go and collect funds, to bring funds for him so he could build temples. Just like uh, in the 70s, Prabhupada was building the Vrindavan temple. There was no money. People were giving some donation, very small donation, maybe one lakh, like that. If you give one Seventy-two, seventy-three, like that. Money was not much available, not flowing very much. So it was difficult for Prabhupada to begin the movement. Prabhupada often said, he said, I went to America with no money. He began the movement with no money. So difficult to do something. But somehow or other, money came. Prabhupada didn't worry about it. He didn't worry about money. He, he just knew that Krishna will give. And Krishna did give. And the devotees would, of course, the devotees would utilize their own energy, their initiative, their enthusiasm to go and collect and bring money, and bring funds for Prabhupada. So Prabhupada could build some temples. So that was, you could say that's part of Prabhupada's legacy, the temples. And in Prabhupada's will, he, he just mentions three places. He mentions uh, Krishna Balaram Mandir. He mentions also the Mayapur temple, Mayapur Vrindavan, Mayapur, well, Chandradaya Mandir. And he mentions also Juhu, Radharasa Bihari temple. He said, these three places must stay. He said, even if everything else falls apart, he said, these three temples, they must remain. So Prabhupada could understand there's always a danger of things maybe falling apart, not very safe, not secure. Prabhupada had seen what happened to the Gaudiya Mat. He saw how in just a few years it had all become divided and disintegrated and all the preaching had stopped and it was just uh, one court case after another. Different groups were fighting with each other, putting cases against each other. Are we okay? You can still hear? Hare Krishna? Yes, yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. Okay, fine, because the power's on and off. I don't know what's... Happening. Maharaj, Maharaj, just a quick question. Would you want to try your video by any chance if it works now? Well, the power's still going on and off. Ah, just okay, gonna... that's fine. But it's we can hear off. you very clearly, Maharaj. Okay, so it's usually advisable we don't put the camera on because once the camera goes on, the signal becomes much weaker and we're easily disconnected. That's fine, Maharaj. We'll see later on if it changes. Sure. So uh, we were speaking about Prabhupada. Uh, he wanted, you know, these, those three temples should maintain. Just in the recent times, we're seeing the difficulties in maintaining with the lockdown in so many parts of the world. It's very difficult to maintain centers, build up big centers, and to maintain them, the overheads. It's really a challenge. It's really difficult. So Prabhupada could understand these difficulties, that there would be difficulties in the future. But still, he wanted those three temples. They were very, very important to him. Of course, since Prabhupada's departure, so many other temples have come up, particularly in India. Many big temples, wonderful centers have been built. And we hope that they can maintain them. At least in India, they should be able to maintain the temples. The, the problems are that we have to be careful about uh, the expenses and not have exorbitant expenses. Srila Prabhupada's legacy then is there in his temple, certainly the ISKCON Society. 
there's not only tampos, but the tampos is it's a major part of the, the legacy. And Prabhupada also, his legacy is there in his books, which are really even more important than the tampos. It's interesting to note that it's, uh, Prabhupada said there were many commentaries made, many different commentaries made on the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But after, by the time Bhaktivinoda and Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada came, they could only find, well, even and they could only find with great difficulty a copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita. And the Chaitanya Bhagwat is there. And then also Chaitanya Mangal is also around, it also came out. So those three books are there, but apparently in the, in the time after Lord Chaitanya departed, there were many different commentators on the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. But only, so today, now we only have these three. So we worry also about Srila Prabhupada that it's very nice for devotees to know about Srila Prabhupada and to hear about him. So the, the, the devotees who have written about Srila Prabhupada, quite a good number of devotees have written about Srila Prabhupada. And that's the, these, these books are part of Prabhupada's legacy. They, the, they open the door into Prabhupada's pastimes. We all enjoy hearing Prabhupada's pastimes, how Prabhupada dealt with different situations. Srila Prabhupada was always an inspiration to the devotees. And Srila Prabhupada, of course, as the not just simply the Acharya, but he was the founder Acharya. So as the founder Acharya, he is the spiritual master for all of the devotees in the ISKCON movement. And we all want to feel connected to Srila Prabhupada. And we, and we certainly encourage all the devotees coming into ISKCON that they should develop their relationship with Srila Prabhupada. So being connected to Srila Prabhupada is an opportunity which is available to everyone who is associating with ISKCON. Many people come to ISKCON looking for a spiritual master. And the first thing they should do is approach Srila Prabhupada. You want a spiritual master? Here, here he is. This is the spiritual master. This is Srila Prabhupada. And he is a teacher. He is the, the guru for all the devotees. So we like very much this uh, principle, which is here in ISKCON, of bringing everyone to be connected to Srila Prabhupada. And hearing about Srila Prabhupada is another important principle for devotees. We need to hear about Prabhupada's activities, how he preached and how he established this Krishna consciousness movement, how he struggled Certainly, it was not easy. It was so, so much struggle. I was just reflecting recently about how much courage Prabhupada must have had. Prabhupada himself was describing to devotees, he was talking about the Victoria Memorial there in Calcutta. And he was describing to the devotees, he said, I remember, he said, when I went up on the top, I went up on the roof of that memorial. When they were constructing it, he said, I had the opportunity to go up on top and to look down from the top of the Victoria Memorial. And so one devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, he said, wow, he said, Srila Prabhupada, you went on top of the Victoria Memorial? He said, you must have been very brave to go all the way up there. You must have been, you have a lot of courage. And Prabhupada looked at him and said, Yes, certainly. He said, didn't I go to America on my own with no money? He said, don't you think that also took courage? Yeah, Prabhupada had so much courage to do his work as a devotee, to go to America. Can you imagine going to a foreign country 
you don't know anybody. He had simply some contact person he'd never met, really. But from, and he had no money also, didn't take money. He brought some books, a few boxes of his books, Indian books, not very much, not very good quality, with lots of typos, but Prabhupada brought the books. And he brought a cereal, a bag of cereal, like that. So Prabhupada was so, had so much courage, so bold. And th then later on, he went to Russia also. That, that was when Russia was still closed up. It was still socialist. It was under the, in the, so socialist, time, in the socialist times. But Prabhupada didn't care. He was so bold. Krishna consciousness cannot wait, right? He'd heard already from Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada that the message of Lord Chaitanya is so urgent. It cannot wait for some political adjustment. You have to go now. So Prabhupada applied that principle after he heard that in 1922 from Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, Prabhupada must have remembered that these words, and it was like his inspiration to go ahead and do his preaching work, to go to America, and then to expand the Krishna consciousness movement to Africa, and Prabhupada also went to Africa himself, and Prabhupada was the first to go to Russia, and he went, he went everywhere just to deliver the message of Krishna. Now, usually, you know, if you're traveling like that, you feel it's quite exhausting. It's quite a demand. And you, you, to be able to write at the same time, it's just so inconceivable. How could Prabhupada do it? That even when he's traveling, he'd get to a place and then every night, the middle of the night, he, he would wake up and he would want to do his writing for several hours. So he was so dedicated to writing presenting this philosophy for the benefit of all of us. So this is the legacy which we have from Srila. This is part of the legacy. Of course, the temples are one thing. The deities are even more of the legacy. The temples themselves, they may fall apart. They may break down. We have to move out. We have something. But the deities, they're there. And Prabhupada did establish a good number of deities in different places around the world. Many people thought about self-realization. Different people would come and speak the Bhagavad Gita. Maybe they would speak their idea of the Bhagavad Gita. But Prabhupada didn't just simply speak Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada also brought the deities. Now, you don't find too many people doing that. that you know, so many so-called gurus from India would go to the West how many of them ever established deities and taught their followers to worship the deity? So our ISKCON movement, the legacy is there with these deities and the particular standard which Prabhupada wanted the deities to be worshipped as well. But it's also a very significant point that Prabhupada was very concerned about the standard of worship. And he made the point, once it's begun, it has to continue. There's no question of stopping. I was fortunate, I joined the movement in London, 1971. We had already the big Radha Landanishwara deities. They were the only full-size marble deities in the ISKCON movement at that time. Even Los Angeles didn't have big marble deities. We were the only temple with big marble deities. We had big deities, we didn't have small ones. <laughs> we had big deities, and we had also Jagannath Baladev Subhadra, as well as Radha Landanishwara. And there were only two brahmanas. There was only, there was one lady, Mundakini Maharaji from France, and there was one other boy, Jaihari Prabhu, and he, he hardly did anything. So the, most, the puja was all done by this one lady, Mundakini Maharaji. She was a young woman at the time. The other devotees had gone off with Prabhupada. 
the ones who had built the temple, like Shamsundar, Gurudas, and Yamuna, and uh, they had all gone to India, but Prabhupada took them to India for his traveling Sankirtan. Makunda Prabhu was, had been there, but he, then he'd also gone back to America. And so the, the, the temple was just run by some young men. Everyone was very young. How were we maintaining? I could not understand how we could maintain the temple. Of course, we were always in debt. <laughs> but somehow, Krishna always provided. We were always uh, met, somehow able to make ends meet. And Prabhupada would come, and we would, in order for Prabhupada to come, Prabhupada would say, all right, send me a ticket. You send me a ticket and I will come. And so the devotees would have to look at what, they'd have to work it out, how to get the money for Prabhupada's ticket. And Prabhupada would come, he would not come alone, he'd come with a servant and he'd have his secretary, he'd have his, the Sanskrit editor, you know, be one party, like three, about three men traveling with Prabhupada. So we had to pay for all these people. And in the times when we had no money, the temple was just supported by whatever money we could raise by selling books on the street, practically. That's how the temple was maintained. But Prabhupada understood these things and he encouraged us. I, re I remember when I, when, when I was initiated uh, that year, 71, I was initiated at... I was initiated along with Subhag Swami. Subhag had joined the movement. I was impressed when I came to the temple. I saw, oh, he, even the Indians are joining this. He was the only Indian in the temple, actually, Subhag. There was about 20 devotees. So he was the only Indian. I was surprised. Oh, an Indian has also joined this movement. This is something unusual. Because there were other spiritual movements, but they didn't have Indians there. So he he was from he was he'd been a student, he'd been studying there in England, and he met the devotees and he immediately joined. His parents actually sent him to London to get him away from sadhus, because they saw when he was at home, he was often going to be with sadhus. So they sent him to London. They thought he'll be safe, get him away from the sadhus. So he went to London and he met the devotees. So that's why Prabhupada gave him the name Subhag. <laughs> Very fortunate. So I, uh, we, when we got initiated, uh, there was quite a number of us initiated all at the same time, about 17 or so of us. So that next morning, Prabhupada called the temple president to his room. And he told the temple president, he said, you know, I initiated many of your men there yesterday. He said, you know, none of them gave me any Guru Dakshin. <laughs> and the temple president laughed and he said, Prabhupada, he said, Srila Prabhupada, they don't have any money. <laughs> he said, they don't have anything. The temple didn't have any money. Whatever, whatever, anybody who had any money, they gave everything to the temple. So we were living together. We were sharing everything. And the temple was just living from day to day. And somehow we were, so, and when Prabhupada heard the devotees didn't have any money, Prabhupada just smiled. And he thought, yeah, this is the British Empire, just see. <laughs> but anyway, we went out on Sankirtan that day and whatever we collected, we gave to Prabhupada. We tried to give some Guru Dakshin to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, I think he could understand that we were giving our life. Just recently, I was reading back to Chiru Swami's book, and he, he was talking about when he joined the movement, and he remembered also when he was initiated, he didn't have any Guru Dakshin to give to Srila Prabhupada. And he told Srila Prabhupada, he said, I'm sorry, Srila Prabhupada, I don't have any money. And Prabhupada said, that's okay. He said, you're giving your life. So I think in the same way also, you know, that we didn't, although we didn't give any guru dakshin, we we're giving our life. And so several of us who were initiated, initiated that day were still devotees, like Subhag Swami, Mahavishnu, Mahavishnu Swami, he was also initiated that day. 
And there were several other devotees who are still in England serving. They're giving their life for the service of Srila Prabhupada's mission. So Prabhupada wanted us to dedicate ourselves to the Krishna consciousness movement. He knew we were very raw and new. We didn't know the culture. And Prabhupada was, had to be very patient and tolerant with us and gradually train us. Oh, sorry. That's... Uh, so. Okay, you can hear me okay still? Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you well. Okay, good. Yeah, the, po the power's still off here, so I'm not going to put the camera on. Uh, okay, so Srila Prabhupada's uh, pastimes. It was, it was really nice to be in India with Srila Prabhupada and see how Srila Prabhupada worked you know i came to india 1970 i think it was 4 or 75 and the movement in india was just beginning we had a very small place in delhi it was in a place called bengali market it was a little house and they had radha krishna deities big radha krishna marble deities because these deities had been worshipped in the, in a, one of the uh, Pandal programs, which they'd had there in Delhi. So after the Pandal program, Prabhupada said, these deities have to stay in Delhi. So those deities are there still in Delhi. They're Radha Partha Sarati. Maybe, you know, if you go to the East of Kailash temple there, you can see Radha Partha Sarati. They were originally worshipped there in a Pandal program in Delhi. And then they were in a little house in Bengali market. And that, that time the temple president was an, a Prabhupada disciple called Tejas Prabhu. Tejas, he's an American body devotee. He was there with his wife and he had one young child, very small child. And there was a couple of other ladies and I think one other man. So I came there and I, I was, that was the situation in, in Delhi at that time. The, it was really difficult in Delhi, and Prabhupada knew that most of the devotees, they didn't like to be in Delhi. It was difficult. One of the difficulties was that people don't speak English. <laughs> it's more of a Hindi-speaking place. And devotees had difficulty to make life members because of that, because of the language barrier. And because we were also very new, People were cautious. Of course, that time there'd been the, the, the Hare Krishna, Hare Ram movie with Devanand, and it wasn't very helpful for our movement. It was kind of bad publicity that people that were considering that these Hare Krishna people, they're just hippies who have come to India, and they're not serious devotees. So it took some time to get the movement established there. But still the basic work was done in Prabhupada's time and Prabhupada would always visit these centers. That was the amazing thing, that while Prabhupada was traveling around the world, whenever he would come back to India, he would come back, for example, he'd come to Vrindavan, but before he would go to Vrindavan, he would come to Delhi to see the temple in Delhi. Although it was just a little house, we had nothing, we had a very small place. But still Prabhupada would come there. He wanted to see the devotees and he would meet whoever was there. We would arrange some important man, some businessman or some life members, different people to come and meet him. And Prabhupada himself had some of his old friends from Delhi. So sometimes they would come to meet him. I remember Prabhupada coming to Delhi and you know, we didn't have any vehicle or anything, but one man came to meet Prabhupada and he had a transport company. So Prabhupada found out that he had a transport company and Prabhupada said to him, he said, oh, you have a transport company? He said, you must have car. And the man said, oh, certainly I have a car. Certainly I have a car. So Prabhupada said to him, so can you arrange my, tra my transport to Vrindavan tomorrow? So the man said, oh, well, well, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> the Prabhupada was very 
very good at these things, you know. He understood the little difficulties are there for the temple. Maintaining the temple in Delhi was not easy. People would often come, they're very sick. They want to go back to the West and they come and stay in Delhi and, and difficult how to send them back. I have to wait for tickets to come. So many problems, but, but Prabhupada would come. He wanted to see, he wanted to make sure the temple is maintained. Prabhupada said, once a temple is opened, it cannot close. He told us like that. Some devotees had made a temple and and then they, they decided they wanted to close the Prabhupada said, once you open the temple, you have to keep it open. You shouldn't close it. So I saw the same in Calcutta. Prabhupada would come in Calcutta Airport. Now Calcutta Airport, it's, it's on the way to Mayapur. And so he could have just went directly to Mayapur. But I never saw Prabhupada do that. Whenever he came into Calcutta, he would immediately come to the Calcutta temple. He would come and stay at Calcutta temple and spend a few days there, give classes, give programs in the evening, meet the people. He cared about every center. It didn't matter how small or how, what was going on there. I can still remember Prabhupada staying in Calcutta temple. Uh, we were, I was staying there for some time and when Prabhupada came, there was only one toilet there, so the whole toilet, the toilet was Prabhupada's. And so we would all have to take bath outside. There was a lake across the road. We would take bath in the lake across the road. <laughs> and quite uh, amazing times those days. Very, we were not very expert to organize everything, but somehow we managed. And Prabhupada would come and he would go on the veranda. He'd come out in his gamsha, he'd take his bath out there on the veranda. Every day, wherever he was, whichever part of the world. I was saying in New York, also the same. So Calcutta, also on the veranda, he'd have his massage. He, he liked to keep his schedule. And part of his schedule, of course, was writing. That was very important for him. He liked to do this writing. And we could understand why he would do it in the middle of the night, because that's when nobody's around. He could be on his own and without disturbance. He could concentrate for several hours without anybody disturbing him. During the day, there would always be things going on, different things, people coming, want to see Prabhupada, different questions and so on. So it was very wonderful to see Prabhupada and to be just in his presence, just to bathe in his presence was so nice. And Prabhupada always encouraged all of us to dedicate ourselves to the Krishna consciousness movement. Anybody who was in Krishna consciousness, if they went away for some time, if they came back to see Prabhupada, Prabhupada would always encourage them, please come back, come back and join us, be with us. Please stay in our movement. Sometimes, you know, even people like who have been sannyasis and so on, Prabhupada would encourage them, come back, come back. Doesn't matter, you're married now. It's okay, you can come back, be a devotee. Be with us. Prabhupada wanted us to be in Krishna consciousness. Didn't matter what position we were in but he wanted us to stay in the Krishna consciousness movement. It was very, that meant a lot to him. And it was very painful for him when he saw people give up Krishna consciousness and leave. Prabhupada would say, we have to shed gallons of blood to make one devotee. We shed gallons of blood to bring one person to Krishna consciousness and to train them and talk spend so much, and then if they go away, then it's all wasted. So it's very disappointing. So Prabhupada was concerned like that. Okay, so I've been speaking for about 45 minutes. Maybe we'll just stop and be, I can take questions or something. Maybe something you want me to talk about or explain.
Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, this is Parmanand Das. Uh, uh, I have a question, Maharaj, if you don't mind uh, me asking. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the next generation of devotees, um, us uh, who are not direct uh, disciples of Srila Prabhupada, uh, but are trying to follow in his footsteps, uh, um, we would we would sometimes wonder, uh, Maharaj. I sometimes wonder, what is the essence of uh, following in uh, Shila Prabhupada's footsteps? Uh, because there's uh, so many instructions, so many letters, so many purports, and uh, um, if you consider them in full, sometimes uh, you know Prabhupada did things because of the time he lived in and stylistically perhaps and sometimes he did things out of principle because they were fundamental so how do we uh, understand clearly what is the essence and follow in his footsteps Maharaj? yes i can understand it's a, it's certainly a challenge now as you mentioned there are different evidences of Srila Prabhupada's instructions you mentioned letters we should understand letters are something very specific. They're addressed to someone, unless there's a, a, a letter which is a general message for everyone, then we should not take the instructions which are in the letter to be particularly relevant to the whole society. But rather, these were instructions given to a particular individual, right? So what, what, are, what are fundamental are the books. The books are the basis. The books, whatever's in the books, now that is very important to us. We definitely want to give importance to the, the information which is there in the books. Lectures can also be time and circumstance, you know? You can also consider different places that be different mode of lecture. Prabhupada coming to New York would give a different lecture for what he would give in Vrindavan. And it would depend a lot also on the time and circumstances, what's going on. So we have to be very cautious. We have to really pray to Krishna to give us the proper intelligence to understand. And just like when we talk about principles and details, we exp it's explained that details can be adjusted, but the principles, they have to remain. The principles don't change, but the details can be adjusted. And how to understand, Prabhupada said, how to understand what's the detail and what's the principle, Prabhupada said, well, that takes some intelligence. So we have to be careful in understanding these different matters. And there's a lot of discussion going on these days within our movement as well. I mean, it's definitely what you say is true. There's a lot of points which are not so easy to understand. What is Prabhupada's desire? Issues like female, you know, Diksha gurus. Should, should the women be also Diksha gurus? This is a, a big issue. And it's not always, it, it's difficult to get a unanimous a decision on these things. It's not everybody can agree with each other about what should be done. What can we say? Uh, I mean, there are arguments to both sides. That when speaking women diksha gurus, that's just one issue, but there's so many other issues also. And we have to be very cautious about coming to decisions on these things. And this is why Prabhupada established the GBC, that this is really the work of the GBC, the Governing Board Commissioners. These are considered to be, you know, the, 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 the manager, the, the leaders or the, the people at the top of our institution. And in this matter, the GBC themselves, they have to be exemplary. They have to be 
exemplary. They have to be perfect examples for others. Otherwise, then the whole system is a mockery. It's a failure. And Prabhupada certainly wanted like that, that the GBC would show the highest standard of devotional service. And in this way, they will be properly guided and they can make decisions to guide the society. So there are difficulties, there are things, you know, if Prabhupada was to come back today, we'd have so many questions to ask him. We can understand, you know, before Prabhupada left, Prabhupada was very clear. He was, he spent many days in Vrindavan with devotee and he would always, many times he would say, so are there any final questions? Is everything clear? Is there any more, is there any final question? And of course, nobody ever thought to even consider anything about spiritual masters or, you know, to ask Prabhupada details about all these things. We didn't like to speak about it because the mood was to encourage Prabhupada to stay with us. All we could think was we don't want Prabhupada to leave. We need Prabhupada. We want Prabhupada with us. Of course, we were immature. We were not realistic. We should have understood that certainly Prabhupada has to leave us someday. I couldn't think of Prabhupada leaving us. But it was obvious to some people. Anyway, now, of course, that Prabhupada did leave us, we, we regret that we didn't take the opportunity maybe to ask all of these things. But there is a, a lot of information given by Srila Prabhupada. He did guide us in many things. And we're grateful for what he gave us. And we have to utilize that and go forward with what he gave us. And the, the message is there, particularly in his books and in his will also, his final will, that's also very important. Uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami did his, P he was working on a PhD thesis and his PhD thesis was based on Srila Prabhupada. And he said, usually when people do a research on someone, there's a, a, a lack, a lack of information about them. But he said in Srila Prabhupada's case, the problem is there's just so much information. There's just so much instruct, there's so many instructions, there are the books, there are the letters, there are the conversations. And Prabhupada wanted us, he wanted, he was very concerned that his morning walk should be recorded. He wanted people to hear his morning conver his conversations. He wanted they should be always recorded. And he was very disturbed that the tape recorders would break down and nothing recorded. It was very important to him. So these conversations certainly must be important, but again, we have to understand in terms of the time, the place, the circumstances. It's a challenge for all of us how to go ahead. So we have to, we have to be pure. We have to really surrender to Krishna and pray to Krishna and when we really take shelter of Krishna, then certainly Krishna will act and he will guide us. What is the proper way to go forward? I, I mean, I, what can I say, Prabhu? I can't give the answers to all these, <laughs> all these questions. These questions are not for me to answer. They're, they're, they're the, the greatest brains in our movement, the biggest brains in our movement are all contemplating these different issues and thinking how to solve these things, what should be done, what's the proper solution.
Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for that. Parman Prabhu, are there questions on the uh, chat group that we see at the moment? Uh, no, Prabhu. No questions yet. Maharaj, I, I there was there was a point, Maharaj, that that you brought up. Um, that um, sorry, Maharaj. Let me just turn on my video. Yes, Maharaj. The, uh, one one of the nice points that you brought up um, that I couldn't help but um, it resonated so much um, was the point that you said that for Shura Prabhupada, going to it didn't matter whether a center was was a large center or it was a smaller center or it was a large temple or smaller temple because Prabhupada cared for for everyone um, and and in one sense um, many of us have grown up in a generation where devotee care is being spoken about um, in a systematic manner but um, I, I just wanted to share the fact that when we really look at Prabhupada's life uh, that's what Prabhupada did uh, for, for all the time that he spent uh, with his disciples and with anyone that he cared to meet. Would you want to uh, elaborate or comment on that, Maharaj? Yes, certainly. Prabhupada really cared about people. He was very personal in his dealings. And he took, a po he took point practically every day. His program was, you know, he would give class in the morning and then in, in the afternoon, there would be like darshan where people could come and sit and they could ask questions to Prabhupada or Prabhupada would have somebody read and they just sit with Prabhupada and somebody would read like Krishna book or something. So Prabhupada liked to be with the devotees. It wasn't like he, he shut himself off from the devotees, but his mood was to be with the devotees. And, and then in the evening, then he would give a class. <laughs> so practically his whole day is with the devotees. And that's really devotee care, being with the devotees. He didn't just care about the devotees, but he cared also about how we were running the society. I remember Prabhupada wanted to see the accounts in London. He wanted to see the accounts. He wanted to see that we were keeping a good record. He said, yeah, he said, in London, we're a registered charity. And so it's very important. Every year our accounts are audited and we have to have good accounts so that they can audit them. And Prabhupada personally looked over the accounts to see, and Prabhupada instructed us how we had to do everything. He said, all the money coming in must be deposited in the bank. So the income is all there in the bank book. You can see how much is coming in. And then when you, you take money out, your expenses, you have, to, you have to have receipts. You have to show where you spent the money, how, how it was spent. So Prabhupada cared about these little details. And then Prabhupada also cared about the devotees. If he saw they had bad health, he would give them instructions what they needed to do. Maybe they needed a chudder to keep warm. If somebody had boils, Prabhupada would say how they could treat it. When Tamal Krishna Maharaj had a hernia, Tamal Krishna Maharaj went off to the hospital in Mumbai to get surgery. And when Prabhupada heard about it, Prabhupada was very worried. And he went after him. He personally went there to bring, he didn't want him to do the surgery in Bombay. He was going to send him back to the West to get it. He was so concerned. He thought maybe they won't do a good job if they do it in Mumbai. He cared so much about the devotees. Prabhupada was not the kind of person to just let devotees go off on their own. If he saw somebody, for example, when, when he heard somebody was at Radha Kund, 
Prabhupada was very worried. And he sent a senior devotee there, said, go there and beg him to come back. Tell him to stay with us. Don't let him stay there. Beg him to come back. So this, this was Prabhupada's devotee care. One devotee was a brahmachari and he was, he was doing well. And he was thinking, you know, he was with Prabhupada in India and on the, the Prabhupada Sankirtan party traveling around India. It was quite difficult, quite exhausting. And so he was, he, he said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I think I, it would be good for me if I go up to somewhere like Rishikesh or Hardwar and I can stay in an ashram there and get my brahmachari life together. He said, is that okay? And Prabhupada said to him, oh no. He said, please don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go there. So Prabhupada really cared about the devotees. He said, even if you're having some difficulties here, he said, just tolerate it. But if you go there, you just waste your time and you'll get so much bad association. So Prabhupada really wanted devotees to be in the association of devotees, to stay with the devotees. At the same time, Prabhupada cared how they associated. I remember in London, that when we got the Bhaktivedanta Manor, George Harrison had purchased the Bhaktivedanta Manor. It was a big place. Previously, we'd been living in, you know, we were really crowded in one little house there in London, in central London, in Bury Place. Later on, they moved to Soho Street. So when they got Bhaktivedanta Manor, most of the devotees moved out to Bhaktivedanta Manor because the government had restricted all of our kirtan there in Bury Place. We, we would make so much noise, the whole block would shake. So the government stopped all the kirtan and no public programs. So most of the devotees moved out to the manor and they were staying at Bhaktivedanta Manor. But when they were staying at Bhaktivedanta Manor, the problem was there was a lot of men and a lot of women, single men and single women. And Prabhupada detected that they're talking to each other. The young men and the young women were associating with each other. So Prabhupada didn't like that. And he, he, he warned the devotees, he said, this is not good. They said, young men and young women shouldn't be seen talking together. They said, if you have something to ask, you can ask quickly, but you don't spend time there with each other, talking to each other. You don't socialize. And so Prabhupada was, he had to instruct all of these kind of things. Prabhupada knew, you know, we're from the West, we have that habit to associate with the opposite sex. And Prabhupada saw that tendency and he warned the, the devotees against it. You have to be careful, you have to protect yourselves. You, we're here, you're here in the temple, this is a temple, this is a spiritual place, and you have to cultivate your spiritual consciousness. So don't sit and talk to the opposite sex. It's not good, not required. So that, that was Prabhupada, you know, Prabhupada's caring. He, he cared, you know, if, if we didn't keep the grounds nice, that was a problem. He, he certainly let us know why nobody's taking care. You have so much land. Why don't you use it? Why don't you grow flowers? Why don't you grow vegetables? Why it's there, just growing weeds only? You must use it, everything given to you by Krishna. You have to use it for Krishna. So please, you grow nice flowers. And when he saw a devotee grow flowers in Mayapur, Prabhupada was so happy, very nice. A devotee had come from Hawaii and he'd been a gardener and he grew very, he grew a lot of flowers in Mayapur and Prabhupada was so pleased. So even told down to today, devotees grow many flowers here in Mayapur. We have a big garden. We have a lot of land, of course, we can grow flowers, but still it's not enough. 
because they have so many deities here. We still have to purchase on big festivals. We always have to purchase more flowers. But Prabhupada liked to see us use everything properly. Yeah. Krishna gives you something, make proper use of it. Okay, uh, uh, there's no other question, no other, no questions, no, no comments. Maharaj, there are a uh, uh, couple more questions. Uh, Devaki Nandan Prabhu, would you like to read them or shall I? Um, thank you, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, we were going to have the session for an hour, but if you don't mind, maybe for a few more minutes, Maharaj, we could have your association. Yes, please. Okay, fine. Um, Yogita Radha Devi uh, Dasi has written this. Srila Prabhupada has given instructions on the same question, but in different ways to different people. On wondering which one to apply in our life, should we also consider which one is suitable for us according to our time, place, and circumstances? Yes, well, you have to be guided. Take the, take the advice of senior devotees. Don't just make your own decision, but you can consult with senior Vaishnavas and hear from them what they have to say. It's always good. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, there's one more question. Uh, Prabhu, do you have the... Uh, Praman Prabhu, maybe you can read it. Uh, yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, so Sri Devi Gaurangi Mataji is asking, uh, the devotees with not good health in these modern times, how do they regulate their devotional life? Also, devotees with many responsibilities, which is most important in their devotional life? Question mark. Uh, recently, one devotee was saying that the health, our health is the most important factor in performing our devotional service. We have to take care of our health. It's very important. It's crucial. Without good health, we won't be able to maintain our devotional service. So he said health is number one. He said then sadhana is number two. Sadhana means you're chanting, you're studying, your worship. You have to keep that, you have to do that. And then number three, service. <laughs> so service comes after sadhana, and, but first is health. Get yourself healthy. Take care of your health. If, just like if you would go to class, if you would be sitting in class and coughing and sneezing like that, then Prabhupada would notice it and say, why don't you take care of your health? Why don't you go and get some ginger tea, drink some ginger, something like that, you know? Prabhupada would certainly notice if he saw someone's got a cut or a big boil, Prabhupada would say, look, you have to take care of this. So we have health problems. Yes, we do. Everyone gets health problems. Material body is vulnerable. We have to take care of our health. We have to keep healthy. What was the second part of the question? Uh, devotees with many responsibilities, uh, how do they understand what is most important in their devotional life? Oh, devotees with many responsibilities, yeah. yes. Uh, well, you have to you have to do what's necessary. You cannot be neglectful, just like you have a family. It's very important. You have to take care of your family. If, you're, if your husband wants to divorce you and the family wants to kick you out of the house, it's not good. You know, you have to, you have to keep the home happy, harmonious. You have to keep good relationships there. You shouldn't make the home in such a, have the home in such a way that everyone hates devotional service and they hate devotees. So somehow you have to try to keep the home, the people in the home happy. And at the same time, you have to continue your Krishna consciousness. If, if the home is not happy, then that's a, a serious problem. Yeah. 
But if you're very cautious and careful, then deal nicely with the family, then gra gradually they will also appreciate Krishna consciousness. That no, oh, this Krishna, Hare Krishna, not so bad. And gradually they'll take a little interest. The, the main thing is to keep them favorable. The family should not be too... So that's only, of course, one responsibility. Some You have many other responsibilities. Maybe you have a job. You have to keep your job. That's important. You have a job you want to maintain. If you're maintaining the family, you have to keep the job. So you don't want to do anything which ruins your career or your job situation. Especially at this time where jobs are quite difficult to find, you know, you have to take care of your job. Responsibilities are there. So of course, you have a house, you have a car, you have to do, you make sure you keep up the payments and <laughs> these kind of things. You have to keep your car serviced, you have to keep it clean and so on. And you have to maintain the house. But you have also sadhana. You have to also think of Krishna consciousness. You can't be neglectful. So it's, it's difficult. There's so many things to be done. We have to make the best use of our time. That's important. Prabhupada told one devotee, he said, don't sleep. He said, if you don't have, he said, he said you're so busy doing so many services. You don't have time to chant 16 rounds. He said, then don't sleep. Don't sleep at night. Just chant your rounds. <laughs> that was Prabhupada's instruction to one devotee. I don't know if you can do that. Of course, that would damage your health after some time if you don't sleep. So you have to get some rest to maintain your health. It's important. So intelligence is required. Krishna will give you the good intelligence, how to handle everything. To those who are constantly devoted to me, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So Krishna will help us. All right? I'm sorry, I can't do any better than that. <laughs> Maharaj, that was excellent, Maharaj. Thank you so much. I think right. you've given us many, many practical points on how we should take Prabhupada's instructions, how to apply them. And on no less than two occasions, you have, you have very importantly pointed out to us that we should use intelligence. And that intelligence comes from Krishna. And thank you so much for giving us a whole uh, deeper perspective of Srila Prabhupada from so, so many different angles, Maharaj. And, and I'm really hoping that all of us in the congregation will deepen our appreciation and our loyalty to Srila Prabhupada and act on all these wonderful moments of association. On behalf of all the devotees today, Maharaj, we want to thank you very much. And we hope that uh, we'll have more opportunities to hear you and we'll reach out to you. And hopefully, if you have time, then we would want to spend more time with you too, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to reflect on Srila Prabhupada and my very limited association with him. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada ki jai. Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. And thank you to all devotees for staying on today and listening. And um, these few weeks have been very wonderful because we've had so much of association from Srila Prabhupada's disciples. Uh, look out for more details of the programs leading up to Srila Prabhupada's appearance. Uh, which will be coming up next week on the 31st of August. And it sh our remembrance of Srila Prabhupada in this very important year uh, should not just end on his, uh, on his appearance day. Uh, it should continue. And we hope to plan more programs this way uh, so that we continue through the year uh, and spend more time and more moments reflecting on Srila Prabhupada as Maharaj so nicely pointed out to us. Thank you very much, Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.